Uh, we've got some questions that have come in from shareholders over the last couple of days. So uh, the first one is what made you pick space? So the reason I like space is is that you can have maximum impact on this planet for for kind of minimum resources and effort. Um, so think about this, uh, you can put a spacecraft in orbit, and we did take an example of a weather spacecraft we put in orbit a few years ago, and that weather spacecraft can provide data and services and knowledge to literally hundreds of millions of people every day, times the duration of the spacecraft's lifetime, which could be 10 years. So this crazy little box of electronics can have just huge amount of impact to so many people. And there's very few industries that you can have that amount of impact or have that amount of reach. Mm -hmm. So that's that's primarily you know, the, the thing I love about space. Plus it's cool. Yeah, cool. Um, next question is, uh, are you contributing to space junk and uh, is there a plan to clean it up? Yeah, so I think uh, anybody who launches anything to space um, you know, has to put their hand on, on their heart and say, yeah, well, sometimes we leave some stuff behind. Um, we've always taken the approach that we want to leave the minimum amount behind as we can possible. So, you know, the way that Electron goes to orbit is quite different to most rockets. Uh, you'll notice that there's like a little bit on the top called a kick stage, and we try and deorbit that wherever possible and just leave behind only the customer's spacecraft. Right. Now, um, that's not the normal thing. Like a lot, of, a lot of countries will just leave the whole spent upper stage of the rocket in orbit. Um, so, that, you know, that, that's, that's you know, pretty nasty. And I think there's a, there's a common misperception that space junk is just dead satellites. Well, actually, it's like one third dead rockets and two thirds dead satellites, or thereabouts. Right. So we certainly do everything we can to, you know, to, to make sure we, we have the minimum impact mm -hmm. as possible. Um, and I would say, as far as companies go or businesses go, we're probably the furthest leaning forward on uh, kind of advocating for some kind of regulation. Right. Um, generally, as an entrepreneur, you don't want any regulation. Um, but this is an instance where you know we, we think that some traffic management is going to be critical, yeah. and we certainly uh, certainly advocate for that internationally. I mean, there definitely seems to be an exponential curve in there with regards to how much is going yeah. up, isn't it? Um, when you say deorbit, like so, you've got a you have to some additional propulsion or something Correct. to get out of orbit, right? Correct, yep. So that, that kick stage has a little rocket engine on it and we circularise the orbit, deploy the spacecraft, and wherever possible we'll burn that engine again and put it into a, into a uh, declining orbit. What, we touched on the, um, a couple of these earlier, but what are the macro factors that impact the space industry and therefore Rocket Lab? Yeah, so I think um, from a, I guess purely from a share price standpoint, you know, there's 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 plenty of you know macro factors, um, you know, that, that that influence that that we have no control over, but kind of generally the the space industry seems pretty insulated from from a lot of these things just because of the duration of the of the of the programs typically. Yeah, do you have any sensitivities to, to or much sensitivity to the interest rate environment and stuff? Obviously, the share absolutely, price, yeah, yeah. The, with the share price, you know, you know, we we, we can we can have uh, a flawless launch and the share price goes down simply because of a, a, of a macro um, environment kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and favourite space movie? Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, um, yeah. And as Good you walk, soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so as you walked into the facility, hopefully, if you've watched that movie enough times, you'll recognise the the entrance portal is actually the right. very similar to the portal of the you know the HAL right. computer. M what's the most accurate space movie? Well, actually, 2001 Space Odyssey is, oh, is actually is, very accurate. Right. It's one of the few space movies that doesn't have sound in in space. Um, ah, right. You, you find you see a lot of a lot of those movies, and you know the 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 cruiser will ignite its engine, and you'll hear this roar, and it's like, uh, no. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, right, that's falling over a, quite a fundamental hurdle, I would say. That. Yeah. Um, what steps are you take, uh, taking to improve the growth of Rocket Lab at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you, you, you can see you can see the, the you know the growth rate um, to date. Um, you know, at seventy odd percent. Um, so uh, you know, we, we're always looking at new opportunities, um, and you know, we're investing heavily into pro, you know projects and products like Neutron. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Neutron is is going to be a huge needle mover. And then um, you know, if you look at the combination of the space and the and the, the launch, um, you know, that that in opening up that that three hundred and twenty billion dollar TAM. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're moving moving pretty aggressively towards that. And has Rocket Lab considered an, adding another launch site in New Zealand or Australia? Um, no. Um, generally, um, 
uh, I avoid launch sites. Um, they are giant cost centres. Um, it costs a lot of money to operate a launch site to staff it um, to to keep it to keep it running. So I want the minimum amount of launch sites possible to achieve our launch manifest because they are you know they're PNL burners. Um, so we don't we don't we don't want more of those. What are the competitive advantages in operating out of New Zealand, and what are the challenges? Yeah, great question. So the reason why we have operations in New Zealand uh, is primarily because of that launch site. Yeah. So all the launch sites in the United States are pretty much flat out. Um, and we made a strategic decision to, to not have to line up behind the, you know, the big players in the industry and wait our turn. Mm-hmm. So you know, it wasn't an easy one because we had to, you know, there had to be a, a, a technology safeguard agreement signed between the two countries. A bilateral treaty had to be created between right. New Zealand and the US. A whole lot of rules and regulations had to be created and amended. A Space agency was created, so like it wasn't an easy thing to do, but but we, we realise it, it now because you know we are the third most frequently launched rocket in the world, and what we're able to do is poke our head outside the hangar and go, ah, today's a good day for launch. We'll go and launch today, um, and moreover, it's it, it meets our business model where customers you know move around on us. Um, yeah. So if you're lined up at the Cape and you miss your window, you're going to wait months to get your next right. window. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we want to move a couple of days down a Mahia, no big deal, we'll just move a couple of days. Great. Are any other companies using the Mahia launch site or is it just... No, no, no. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we operate the only private orbital launch site in the world. I'll ask this one because it's here. So, um, tasty or eat em cheese? Tasty every day. Right. <laughs> nice. Now we've got the important stuff out of the way to get into this one. Uh, once Neutron R&D is complete and the rocket is operational, do you anticipate that you'll need to reduce your engineering R&D headcount to become cash flow positive? or will the staff be able to be reassigned to further space systems development while still maintaining a healthy profit? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if, if we were just going to stop at Neutron, maybe, right. but we're not. Um, you, you've seen, our, you've seen our, our, um, our kind of growth agenda here. Um, you know, Neutron is one important piece of, of a puzzle to, to get to an end-to-end space systems company and, and really move into those products and services and, and delivering infrastructure in orbit. And I mean, the same question could have been asked of Electron, but the one thing I will say is the one thing that, that has always been a throttle on this business is talent. Right. And we can never pipe enough people, enough engineers into this business to, to you know, to continue on the growth trajectory that we want. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I just can, I, I never see that that being, a, you know, a, a challenge. And um, and and I think you know, Neutron is is a very transformational um, kind of product line uh, in in its own right. Um, and the amount of engineers that that you have to you know to deliver that product isn't as is as many as you think, um, and those engineers will be you know quickly uh, kind of you know redeployed in, into into other growth opportunities. Yeah, great. That's a good question. A bit of a site tour at the moment. So uh, where are we, uh, Peter, and what have we got here? So this is um, sort of part of the foyer, and uh, this is actually a recovered upper stage of um, of an Electron rocket. So this is the very first rocket that we brought back down uh, from space, and uh, and we, we, we cut it up and stuck it in the foyer. And if you ever want to touch something that's that's been to space and back, then n- now's your chance. Very cool. And where did you, where did you find it? So we fished this out of the out of the ocean. So uh, this was on uh, return to sender mission. Yeah. So flight 16, um, and you know it uh, it it um, separated in its normal trajectory, and then followed a ballistic arc. We re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, and then landed in the ocean, and then picked it back up. So one of the coolest receptions, um, well certainly the coolest reception I've ever been into, we heard a story about the idea of this when you walk into Rocket Lab, can you tell us a little bit about the thinking into the space? Yeah, so as you, as you enter the portal behind you there it should look a little bit like 2001 Space Odyssey and, and you, 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 you know, you want to be transformed when you come in here into into you know what the space business is actually like. So you know this this area um, is is kind of a reception for sure, but also um, behind the, all those glass panes there is you know that's mission control. So um, it gives a great opportunity for staff or visitors to to, to come here and uh, and actually experience a launch and, and watch uh, watch mission control um, as as it kind of happens. 
Yeah, and what are what are the people in there? Mission crew, there's no launches today, but we've got a bunch of people in there. What are they sort of up to on the day today? Yeah, so on on a, on a day to day basis, um, you know, they're, they're running uh, either whole stage tests or stack tests um, or launching. We also run some some of our satellite missions out of there. We actually have five mission controls across all of our sites uh, in the world, and um, at any one time, you know, we're we're controlling spacecraft or um, launching rockets and and various kind of testing activities out of all of those mission controls. Yeah, great. And we've got a, um, a sort of NASDAQ, uh, looks like the, the Bell site or something from, but can you tell us a little bit why you chose to, the NASDAQ as the place to list the company? Yeah, so I mean, from from a high growth tech company standpoint, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ exchange, you know, just really suited us. Um, you know, most, it's most accurately represents who we are as a company.